lot of get your credit. This is, um, we're gonna have a lecture until about 12.45 and then we'll have time for about 10 minutes of questions before folks need to head off to class. So today we are honored to have Jen Duggan from Conservation Law Foundation. Jen is the Vice President and Director of CLF's Vermont office. And before joining CLF, Jen was General Counsel at the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources, where she led the agency's response to PFOA drinking water contamination in Vermont. Prior to working at the agency, Jen was managing attorney for the Environmental Integrity Project in Washington, D.C., where she managed the Coal Free Waters campaign and represented community groups and other organizations in permit proceedings, citizen enforcement actions, and federal and state rulemakings pertaining to coal plants, oil refineries, and large sources of pollution. And most importantly, Jen received her JD and her Master's of Studies in Environmental Law from Vermont Law School. So we are very happy to welcome her back. Please welcome Jen Duggan for her talk, What's in Your Water? Thank you for that introduction and for the invitation to come and talk with you all today about one of my one of the topics I'm most passionate about, and that's safe drinking water. So many of us take drinking water for granted. We just expect safe and clean water when we turn on the taps in our house, when our child takes a drink at a school water fountain, and when we fill up our water bottles at school or work. But with the heartbreaking lead crisis in Flint, Michigan, and the widespread contamination of water supplies with toxic Teflon chemicals, people are slowly starting to wake up to the fact that we ought to be asking more questions about our drinking water. How safe is my drinking water? What is in my drinking water? How did those contaminants get into my tap water? The answers for parents in Flint, Michigan, and Bennington, Vermont, and in communities across the U.S. are often devastating. Our drinking water is at risk from toxic chemicals, from pesticides, from large-scale industrial agricultural operations, aging infrastructure, climate change, and much more. The truth is, is that there is a drinking water crisis in this country, and our laws just don't guarantee safe drinking water for all of us. So we don't have enough time to cover all the threats to drinking water today, I'm, but I'm gonna talk about where I see some of the most significant gaps and challenges under the current regulatory framework and talk about some possible solutions going forward. It is gonna be a little gloomy at points, um, but I do promise I'll end on some bright spots right here in Vermont. So just to give folks some context, um, I want to give a brief overview of the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is the bedrock environmental law that protects our drinking water. We'll talk a little bit more detail about the law as we talk about the different gaps in protection. But the Safe Drinking Water Act applies to public drinking water systems, and the way it's supposed to work is that EPA does the work to identify contaminants set standards for those contaminants, and then review and revise those on a regular basis with new information, new technology. And they enforce where states don't enforce, and they retain um, uh, general oversight over the state programs. States can apply for what's called primacy. That gives them primary enforcement responsibility, and states enforce drinking water standards, and they implement other provisions of the Safe Drinking Water Act, like source water protection rules. They are required to report compliance data to, the, to EPA. Um, and they also can identify contaminants and set standards. So even though EPA, e even though EPA is generally the primary um, uh, agency responsible for that. States also have authority to set standards as well. Water system operators, they are supposed to provide safe and clean water to customers. They have to comply with their permit terms and they have to sample and report uh, those results and any violations to the state. 
they have to provide customers with an annual water quality report. These are called consumer confidence reports so that folks have basic information about whether or not the system is in compliance, if there are any violations of standards. And they have to notify customers when there is a violation. So let's talk about what's in and what's out under the Safe Drinking Water Act. What's in? Public water supplies, which are defined as 15 service connections or servicing at least 25 people, and about 100 contaminants. So what's out um, under the Safe Drinking Water Act? Very small systems, private drinking water wells, and most importantly, tens of thousands of other contaminants. Most contaminants in drinking water are not covered by the Safe Drinking Water Act. So we, EPA has established about 100. We know that numerous studies conducted by the U.S. Geological Survey and, other, um, and others document thousands of unregulated contaminants, things like per and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS. Um, how many folks have heard of PFAS in this room? So these are the toxic Teflon chemicals that are really a sort of a perfect, a public health perfect storm. They are toxic in very small concentrations. They are um, persistent in, the, in water and in the body. They are bioaccumulative. They are highly mobile in water, so they spread contamination easily. They are used in hundreds of different industrial applications and consumer products, things like you know, uh, rainproof um, or waterproof rain gear, microwave popcorn bags, nonstick pans. Um, and there are about 4,000 of them. So there are a lot of different kinds of these compounds in the environment. And these are highly dangerous at small concentrations. They are carcinogens, um, kidney, testicular cancer. New research is now showing that there is a risk of pancreatic cancer at levels as low as 0.1 part per trillion. They have adverse impacts on the immune system. Um, they can cause liver disease and a whole host of other health problems. They're not regulated in drinking water at the federal level. Pharmaceuticals are also often found in, in source water and in drinking water. Microplastics. There was a report just last week that looked at how much microplastics we ingest on a weekly basis. And it's about five grams per week. That's the equivalent of a credit card every week that we're ingesting through, primarily through drinking water and microplastics and food. So none of these are regulated under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And EPA appears to be completely paralyzed with respect to setting standards. They have not set a new drinking water standard since 1996. So I just had to put together this slide just to sort of show the absurdity of what we're talking about with the uh, scope of the Safe Drinking Water Act. There are about 100 regulated contaminants um, under the Safe Drinking Water Act. EPA has set health advisories for about 500 more. So health advisories are not an enforceable standard. They are a guidance uh, level for states um, and the federal government, but they are not um, a regulatory standard. And then according to the Toxic Substances Control Act inventory, there are about 68,000 chemicals. We are barely scratching the surface in terms of what we are exposed to in drinking water. So why is EPA so far behind? It is a complex process to set a drinking water standard. EPA has to convene science advisory councils. They have to make regulatory findings on toxicity and treatment and cost benefit. But a big driver of this is a lack of political will. When we set an MCL, a drinking water standard, a maximum contaminant level for a pollutant, it triggers treatment. And that treatment is costly. Um, and it also usually becomes a cleanup standard, which creates liability for folks that have released that contaminant in the environment. That can be incredibly costly for polluters. 
The federal government is often one of those polluters, and they're on the hook for cleanup. PFAS is found in firefighting foams, and it's used on military bases. Um, a significant number of federal bases are contaminated with PFAS, and also perchlorate. This is another example of where EPA has acknowledged that there's a risk to drinking water from a very dangerous chemical, but has not been able to regulate it and also found on military bases and a lot of federal facilities. So for the contaminants that are regulated, the individual drinking water standards are often not sufficient to protect public health in multiple ways. So if we're looking at a few examples with respect to individual standards, let's talk about a maximum contaminant level. These are a numeric standard, a numeric drinking water standard, and most folks assume that these are health-based standards, but they're not a purely health-based standard. The way that EPA sets a maximum contaminant level is that it starts with a maximum contaminant level <coughs> goal, and that's supposed to be the value, the concentration that would be fully protective of public health. Then they adjust that standard to account for cost and technological feasibility and a few other factors. What happens is that we end up with a regulatory standard that does not protect public health. Arsenic, the maximum contaminant level goal is zero, but the drinking water standard is at 10 part per billion, even though the National Academies of Science has stated that there is still a serious cancer risk that remains at 10 part per billion, but that is the drinking water standard. The lead and copper rule is another example. Lead, widespread consensus that there is no safe level. Exposure can have permanent and lifelong consequences for kids especially. Lead contamination comes from pipes, so you can't really monitor it at the drinking water plant because the contamination happens after it leaves the plant. So EPA has developed a treatment technique standard. And what that means is that water system operators are required to use corrosion control to help bind up that lead in the pipe. And then they do sort of spot checks in homes in the public water system to see is that corrosion control working or not. And if a certain percentage of um, homes have levels above 15 part per billion, then that water system operator has to do more with respect to corrosion control. But that does not address schools and other facilities because lead is so variable, you have to actually test at the tap to know whether or not somebody's being exposed. So this. This rule doesn't address schools and other facilities. And even, um, even in places like Flint, Michigan, where we were well aware that there were major violations and serious impacts to folks, they were still reporting compliance with the federal lead and copper rule. So this is just another example of a drinking water standard that just doesn't make the grade in terms of public health. I also want to talk a little bit about the chemical by chemical approach that we use to set standards. And use the, talk about PFAS again. These are, this is a class of chemicals that has about 4,000 chemicals um, in that class. Um, it's incredibly time and resource intensive just to set one standard. We've talked about um, the, the challenges um, with sort of the politics around setting that standard. These standards are subject to judicial review. Um, they can take a long time to go through that process. Um, when we're doing that one by one with a class of chemicals that are 4,000, it is like a dangerous game of whack-a-mole. Regulators will just never be able to catch up. The sort of the second piece of this is that when we set those standards and we think about the health impacts, we're not looking at contaminant mixtures. So we are not just exposed to arsenic 
and isolation or PFAS or microplastics or you know, whatever other pollutant we're talking about, we're generally exposed to a mixture, but we don't look at the health impacts from the exposure to all of those at one time. The other way that rules are um, insufficient to protect public health is weak monitoring. So why do we really care about monitoring? Well, the whole regulatory framework for the Safe Drinking Water Act is built around monitoring and reporting. If we don't monitor, we have no way of knowing whether or not that drinking water is safe. And a lot of people sort of brush off violations of monitoring and reporting requirements as sort of paperwork violations. But those can really mask serious health-based violations. So monitoring is really critical to compliance. But the rules, the monitoring requirements and drinking water rules can be infrequent. They can have monitoring done at the wrong time. Um, or the monitoring can be done at the wrong place. <coughs> so looking at the frequency of monitor, monitoring, the rules for inorganic chemicals, things like arsenic, cadmium, mercury, initially for that initial compliance period, folks have to monitor them once a year or once every three years depending upon where they're pulling their source water from. If they have three consecutive uh, samples below the MCL, then they are free for almost nine years. So there's no way that we can really ensure continuous compliance with a standard if we're monitoring once every decade. The rules don't always account for seasonal variations. So think about pesticides, and those are applied at different times throughout the year. You may see contamination in the water right after pesticides are applied, but when you're monitoring several months later, you're not gonna see that contamination and you don't really have an accurate assessment of whether or not somebody has been exposed. And finally, the monitoring is sometimes done at the wrong location. So in some cases, the contamination happens after the water leaves the plant. We've already talked about lead as an example of that, but there are others. Um, asbestos, for example. So asbestos has been widely used um, in cement piping for water mains throughout the United States. These lines are deteriorating and that asbestos is released into the drinking water. But we're not testing for it at the tap. We're testing for it before the problem even occurs. So those are just a few examples of how the rules don't always protect public health, even for those few contaminants that we do regulate. So I have more bad news. <laughs> I promise there's gonna be some bright spots at the end. Um, our drinking water infrastructure is really, really old and it's in terrible shape. So the reason we care about that is because old leaking pipes and outdated water treatment means it's more likely that we're gonna have contamination in drinking water supplies. Most of our water systems are not operating with current modern treatment technology that can remove the type of industrial chemicals, pesticides that we're seeing in our water. How many folks are familiar with the American Society for Civil Engineers, the report cards that they give? So folks, these are an assessment of how we're doing with respect to infrastructure and they do these nationally and they also grade states. And one of the things that they look at is drinking water. In the most recent uh, report card, the US drinking water infrastructure made a grade of D. Most pipe in the US is between 75 and 100 years old. It is time to replace them we have about 240,000 water main breaks every year. That is about six billion gallons of lost drinking water every day. And it's gonna cost about a trillion dollars to repair and upgrade the system over the next 25 years. So how are we doing in Vermont? Not much better. So Vermont got a C minus on the most recent report card in the survey that they looked at to sort of assess how well our pipes are holding up, 
they found 117 leaks and about 257 miles of pipe. That is about 1 million gallons of drinking water lost every day. And EPA estimates that it's going to cost around 640 million over the next 20 years for Vermont to fix and upgrade our drinking water system. It's only going to get worse and it's going to cost even more money if we don't start acting now. Another weak link in public health protections are small community water systems. These are systems that serve 3,300 people or less, and they often struggle with compliance. They are high risk for both health-based and monitoring and reporting violations. Um, NRDC did a really great analysis a few years ago looking at community water system data for 2015, and they looked at systems serving less than 500 people. So these are the very small systems. And 70 percent of all violations in the U.S. were small community systems. 50 percent of all health-based violations were small community systems. Larger systems have higher capacity to both maintain compliance and then get back on track if they violate um, the rules. So why is that? So these small systems lack capacity, they lack financial capacity, they lack administrative capacity, and they lack technical capacity. So they've got, they generally have a much smaller customer base. They may be located in lower socioeconomic or rural areas where people have less ability to pay for the true cost of clean water. And when you don't have funding to do upgrades and repairs and make sure that your treatment is operating properly, that puts you at higher risk for contamination. And the folks that are running these systems, they are often part-time and they're not environmental professionals. And from a technical perspective, they may not be able to pay someone enough money to attract um, someone that has the necessary technical um, expertise to operate the system. I don't know if you've ever toured a water treatment facility, but to make them work properly, generally, you know, it is pretty complex. There's constant monitoring, there are chemicals and treatment involved. So this can be a pretty big ask for someone that is part-time that doesn't have sort of the sufficient technical expertise or any kind of environmental background or training. So in Vermont, DEC, the Department of Environmental Conservation, has identified small community systems as one of our greatest challenges with respect to drinking water. 37% of Vermonters that are on a water system are served by a small community system. If we want safe drinking water, we have got to do a better job of getting these small community systems the resources they need. So even when we have a standard in place that fully protects public health, um, it's meaningless if we don't enforce that standard. And a, an enforcement system has got to be set up so that the cost of noncompliance is greater than the cost of compliance. Otherwise, it's a really easy decision to violate the law if there are no or very limited consequences when you do. And under the Safe Drinking Water Act, states and EPA don't take formal enforcement action most of the time. In that same analysis that NRDC did, they looked at health-based violations and enforcement and found that only about 21% of those violations were referred to enforcement, and only about 6.7% of those actually had penalties attached to them. So why are penalties important? Um, if you, if there's no cost for noncompliance, it's a slap on the wrist and it's a lot easier to ignore the law. So penalties are a very important component of a strong enforcement system. For monitoring and reporting, about 13 percent were referred for formal action. That's only about one out of every 10 violations actually got formal enforcement with about 3% of those with any kind of penalties attached to them. We're not doing much better in Vermont. Um, for the year that we have the most, the most recent data, which is 2017, 
Um, there were about 767 notices of violation issued to about 350 systems. 30% of community systems had at least one violation. 20% of non-transient systems, these are things like schools, office buildings, things where people go every day. 26% um, of transient systems, these are things like restaurant, hotels, campgrounds, had at least one violation. That's not a good average for safe drinking water. Only about 1% of these systems were actually referred to formal enforcement. The other quick point I just wanted to note about the Safe Drinking Water Act and enforcement is that the citizen enforcement provisions of the Safe Drinking Water Act are weaker than other environmental statutes. Under the Safe Drinking Water Act, citizens can't ask a court to impose penalties on a water system operator if they violate the law. And there's also no provisions related to an emergency, a public health emergency. So under the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, for example, if there's an imminent and substantial endangerment to public health or the environment, citizens can take that operator to court and ask the court to address that. There is no provision like that under the Safe Drinking Water Act. EPA can take emergency action, but they're not required to. So we have a situation where there's a very weak enforcement culture at the EPA and state levels, and citizens also don't have the tools they need to hold operators accountable where EPA and the states fail to act. So those are some pretty big structural and systemic challenges all by themselves, but there are two additional concepts I just want to overlay on top of all this for folks to think about. The first is that Access to safe and clean drinking water is a social justice issue. Looking at the data from the Safe Drinking Water Act database shows that counties with a higher proportion of people of color, low income households, and uninsured households are more likely to have unsafe water on tap. And the equity issues arise in many different ways in the context of drinking water. So here are a few examples to think about. Polluting facilities that can contaminate drinking water are often located disproportionately in minority and low-income neighborhoods. Vulnerable communities often lack power to influence decision-making about actions that impact their drinking water. Government response to contamination can vary depending upon what neighborhood you live in. And poor communities have fewer resources to maintain and upgrade their water systems. So we could spend hours surfacing equity issues and unpacking them, all of these issues that arise in the context of drinking water. But I think the thing that I want you to take away today is that this is a social justice issue and that it really demands our attention and our focus when we're talking about solutions to this problem. The second thing to lay on top of all this is that climate change is just gonna exacerbate all of these problems. On the slide here, you can see some recent headlines about climate change, impacts on drinking water. We know that climate change is gonna bring more intense rain events and more mega storms in certain parts of the US, and it's already happening. One of the figures that really shocked me the most is that already we're seeing this, these more intense storms on a pretty significant uptick. So rain falling in the most intense 1% of precipitation events, so those really intense rain events, that is up 71% in the Northeast based on data from, the, from 1958 to 2012. That is remarkable. So what happens during megastorms and these intense rain events? One, we've got sewage chemicals, animal waste, and other contaminants washing into water and drinking water sources. Hurricane Harvey in Texas hit one of the largest petrochemical complexes in the world. That, rain, that type of rain and wind that overloads stormwater controls, it floods waste lagoons and tank farms. From one facility alone, a half a billion gallons of industrial wastewater and stormwater 
were discharged during that storm. That's just one plant. There were more than 100 environmental releases of benzene, vinyl chloride, phenol, and a lot of other dangerous chemicals into, that were released into waterways and air during that storm. And those are the ones that we know about. <coughs> These storms often, they also cause significant damage to drinking water infrastructure. So looking back to tropical storm Irene, 13,000 Vermonters had to boil drinking water in the days and the months following that storm due to damage from drinking water infrastructure. We know that climate change is gonna decrease source water quality, so where we're pulling our drinking water from. We are witnessing in Vermont an increase in toxic algae blooms as the weather and the summers get warmer and warmer. Increased risk of drought and also increased water demand or are there gonna be other impacts to drinking water utilities uh, from climate change. So I don't know about you, but that's not acceptable to me. We must do better and we can do better. I think that when we talk about solutions, we have got to take a hard look at the equity issues that arise in the drinking water context and prioritize solutions that advance social justice and ensure equal access to safe and clean drinking water for everybody. A few things that I think that we need to do to start addressing the problem is we have got to turn off the chemical faucet. It's gonna be very hard to meet this challenge unless we rethink how we regulate chemicals in the United States. So we, our statutes and rules that regulate chemicals, we need to ensure that the burden is on the corporation to prove that that chemical is safe before it is allowed to become part of the marketplace. Right now, the burden is primarily on regulators and citizens to show that a contaminant is unsafe once it's been in the environment and has caused harm. So there have been some recent improvements to the Toxic Substances Control Act, but they're not enough. EPA is still approving PFAS, new PFAS coming onto the market. We have to invest in infrastructure. So most of, many of the violations that we see are the result of leaking and broken pipes and outdated treatment systems. And investing in infrastructure, it saves lives, it reduces disease, and it also creates a lot of jobs. There are amazing reports and figures out that sort of look at, for every dollar we invest in drinking water and other infrastructure, how many jobs that creates in the US. Part of this investment has got it can't just be to pull up the pipe and replace it. We need to be thinking about how to promote climate resilience and doing things better, um, making sure that we're thinking about the risk from climate change when we're rebuilding this infrastructure. And we've got to find a way to get more resources and build more capacity at small community water systems. We also need to strengthen drinking water standards. We need to start thinking about regulation in a proactive way, thinking about classes of chemicals. Instead of waiting until we find contaminants in a drinking water system, we should be thinking about what, doing more robust source water analysis. What is in the watershed? What is likely to be in the water? And install that treatment to make sure that people are protected and not wait until they've been exposed. We can't burn resources chasing down these chemicals one by one. We've got to start thinking about regulating them as classes or subclasses. And we have to get rid of the regulatory fiction that we are only exposed to one contaminant at a time and start looking at cumulative impacts from contaminant mixtures. We've got to do a better job with respect to monitoring requirements. And we need stronger rules for private wells. We need to strengthen enforcement. So we have got to change the enforcement culture at the EPA and state level to make sure that operators expect formal action and penalties when they don't comply. And we need stronger citizen supervisions for the safe drinking water so that we have tools to hold operators accountable when EPA and the states don't act. And the last thing I wanna point out is that States have got to start stepping up and leading. Traditionally, 
it has been, you know, EPA has sort of taken the lead on developing these drinking water standards. They have the technical expertise, they have more resources, but they're falling down on the job. And we're fighting rollbacks at the federal level. There's no hope of thinking about how we expand public health protections. So states have got to pick up the slack. And so the bright spot I will leave you with is that Vermont is actually doing that. And just this last session, the legislature passed two bills that are the strongest in the nation with respect to drinking water. And the first one is a bill that requires testing and treatment for lead in school and child care facility water. So this was a major gap under the lead and copper rule and the state laws related to, to lead. And so we now have strong requirements for testing at all taps that could be used for drinking or cooking and a requirement to clean that up. Um, and the second one is, uh, is, the, is a bill that is a comprehensive bill to address toxic Teflon chemicals or, or PFAS. Um, that statute sets a drinking water standard for a group of PFAS. That's one of the strongest um, of any state that's set an MCL for these PFAS. And they're required to test, the water system operators are required to test for about 20 different kinds of PFAS in the water. And the agency is going to have to go through a formal rulemaking process to evaluate how to regulate this as a class, which is a huge step forward. So the challenges are daunting, <coughs> but I do think that there's been much more public attention on drinking water issues in the past decade, and we are making some progress. So I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions. I mean, we, we've got to make it a priority. I mean, I think that there are already efforts. There's, there's actually been um, a bill that's been passed in the House that would um, give a significant amount of money to state revolving funds, which is the fund that's used to fund drinking water infrastructure. It's, so the political will may not have been there in the past, but I think with the attention on PFAS and some of these mega storms, folks are slowly starting to understand that we're just shooting ourselves in the foot if we're not investing in infrastructure. It's only going to cost more if we don't fix things before they break. And so I think that, yes, it is very hard to persuade people to invest in things like infrastructure, um, but I think that there is a very strong case to be made that it actually increases jobs and because of all of the challenges that we're seeing with respect to drinking water across the U.S. right now, it's becoming more, um, it's, been, it's been becoming more politically palatable to get behind supporting that level of funding. But we're, it's not gonna happen overnight. Um, and states have a role to play also. Um, sta the decline, you know, states have declining, they've been spending, I think over the past 10 years, 22% um, less in terms of investment in infrastructure. So states will have to play a role. And then we need to start charging customers the true cost of clean water. So we need to do that. And then we need to also have public assistance programs similar to the way that we do for heating and fuel for low income folks. But we've got to start valuing clean water for what it's worth. So everybody has a role to play in making sure that we close that gap. Why 
I think that's a really great question. Um, and I have no insight into the inner workings of Governor Scott. Um, so I can't tell you why he vetoed that. I can only say that we were incredibly disappointed. Um, it passed with a um, significant majority in both the House and the Senate. Um, and it is just a very small step forward in leveling the playing field for folks that have been exposed to contaminants. Um, so, you know, I think that based on some of the signals that he had been giving leading up to the veto, we weren't surprised, um, but we were incredibly disappointed. And we hope that the legislature will vote to override that veto when they return um, in January. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I think that under that new standard, there is a lot of room for mischief in terms of um, m playing with that number in terms of the maximum contaminant level. Um, they have a lot of discretion and flexibility. I don't necessarily think that it's, I don't think that's what stopped them from promulgating a standard. Um, and it's kind of unclear what that type of analysis will look like because they've not set a standard since 1996. They just proposed a maximum contaminant level for perchlorate last month. This is the first proposed standard in 23 years. So I think it will be, and I haven't had a chance to really dig into that analysis but they set that standard at 56 parts per billion. EPA had previously issued um, guidance or a standard at, uh, I think it was 15 parts per billion, and states that have enacted rules have set it at six and two parts per billion. So the sort of the initial reaction from the environmental public health community is that they have you know, use that those that those provisions to manipulate that number to a level that is just not safe. Um, the other thing that happened in 1996 is that there were new requirements for EPA to pick contaminants and um, make regulatory determinations as to whether or not to regulate. And then once they make a decision to regulate, they've got I think it's, I can't remember, it was 18 months or two years to do a proposed standard. I think it's two years to do a proposed standard and then 18 months after that to finalize it. Um, but they're not keeping up. You know, they're just not keeping up. Um, and the only regulatory determination they've ever made where they found regulation was required was for perchlorate. They, they, are, they are, the scope of what they regulate um, is much more expansive um, and their standards are much more towards putting the burden on a company to demonstrate that something is safe. Um, it's not perfect, um, but they're further on that continuum than we are um, in the U.S. and their standards are um, 
closer aligned to health, to a pure health-based standard. Um, so they, they absolutely can be looked at as a, as a model, as something better, but it's not perfect. Yes, and I, the, you raise up a good point, and that's something that we didn't really, I didn't really have time to cover, but bottled water um, is a huge challenge because that water is not necessarily safer or cleaner, and you, are, you have the issues with privatization. You also have the issues with plastic, um, and so, you know, plastic is created with you know, using fossil fuels and chemicals. It can, it's a significant contributor to the climate crisis. Um, so bottled water is not the solution. Um, and so I think that I that is a challenge though, um, because that's the first thing that happens when you have a contaminated, you know, situation with drinking water is that everybody pulls in the plastic water bottles. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that we need to recognize the challenges with bottled water, that it's not regulated in a way to ensure that it's safe, that there is a challenge with privatization of water and access, paying for that water, and then the, the toxic, the public health, and the climate issues associated with bottled water. So that, everybody needs to have a clear understanding of that, and I don't think that many people think about plastic or bottled water in that way. So that's sort of the first thing is sort of that education piece. And then it is investing in addressing that root problem, the contamination, um, not just switching over to bottled water. So under one of the amendments in 1996 was also a requirement to, um, for states to have a capacity development program. So the state of Vermont has a program that, um, that does sort of two parts. One is that there are rules that prevent a small system from coming online if they can't demonstrate that they have adequate financial, administrative, and technical capacity. But the other part of that is that they have a program where they can work with small water system operators to identify resources for them um, as well. So I think a good place to start is the DEC drinking water program. And then they know, or you talk to them and educate them about this kind of at least good practices. They, if you, they have public, I've actually talked with the head of the drinking water program. Um, and and they in their their report that they put out their annual report they have consistently recognized small community water systems as one of their biggest challenges and the need and where they need to be focused on putting resources. We're actually um, going to meet later this summer to actually talk about what the state's plan is for doing that going forward. Um, so they are the director of that program is intimately aware of the challenges and has sort of circled it as a priority. What about regulation under the Clean Water Act where people are becoming off site for people have to leave their communities, et cetera? Um, understand that there's not much of an answer to that. In terms of the regulation? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I think that we have to be thinking about PFAS 
tackling that particular problem in a much more comprehensive way. And so um, because it is found in so many different sources, you know, we are thinking about, we need to be thinking about um, industrial operations that discharge PFAS wastewater to wastewater treatment plants that don't have the capacity to clean that PFAS up. It goes in surface water um, and it uh, and it ends up in the sludge, which is then land applied and can contaminate groundwater and crops. Um, the new law that the governor signed, the PFAS bill, requires the state of Vermont to do comprehensive testing on industrial dischargers, wastewater treatment facilities, sludge operators, the land application sites where sludges are found, and then all other potential PFAS sources out there, car washes, um, electroplating facilities, paper recyclers, and the, the intent is that they come back with a report and a next step for how we start tackling and getting PFAS out of our waste streams. There's a lot of work to do <laughs> on PFAS. Thanks for having me.